Hi everyone, welcome to the fourth instalment in the Replatforming Deplatformed Women lecture series organised by the Cambridge Radical Feminist Network. My name's Phoebe Fuller and I'm co-president of the network and with me are my co-president and fellow organiser Sophie Watson and Imogen Galilee who founded the network back in 2018. And as ever, we have the wonderful Mary from Object, who's handling all of our tech. So if you notice any issues that come up, um, do let Mary know and she'll be on it to sort them out. Um, this is also your reminder to be on your best behaviour in the chat and in asking questions. We hope that you'll disagree and ask challenging questions, um, but we ask that you do so politely um, or Mary will be forced to. Um, I am determined to make this a verb, Jackie Weaver, anyone who doesn't engage in the spirit of the event. And for those of you with us on Zoom, if you could make sure that you ask any questions you have of the panelists using the Q&A function at the bottom, which you can find on the toolbar uh, and not the chat as it just makes it a lot easier for me to keep up with your questions and make sure that I don't miss any. But do also feel free to comment or have conversations using the chat function if you want to. Um, those of you joining us from YouTube, if you just put your questions in the comment uh, thread on the live stream, we'll all be keeping an eye on that too. So hopefully we won't miss any of your questions. Just a reminder as well that YouTube is public. Um, so be wary of posting personal information on there. If you want to keep up with us on our um, live tweeting, then use the hashtag CamRadFems. Just a quick, couple of quick thank yous before I hand over to our panellists for this evening. Sophie and I would like to say a big thank you to the rest of the network, um, especially Eve, for all of the beautiful posters and the promotional material that you'll have seen online. And of course, we have to thank Object and Mary for lending us your platform and your time. We couldn't have hosted these events without them. Uh, lastly, we just want to thank you, our audience, not only for watching tonight, but for all of the support that you've given us over the past three events. Your feedback has been really gratifying, given the amount of time and effort that's gone into hosting these events. We believe as a network that these events are the way forward in, in feminist free speech. They can harass and intimidate us um, with threats of rape and violence. They can threaten to report us to our educational institutions and our workplaces. They can assault us, but they cannot ever stop us from speaking. I know that there's a wide age bracket watching us now, but I know from emails that there are a number of older feminists who are joining and just be rest assured that the, this new generation of feminists will not be cowed and we will not be silenced. Uh, we will always find ways to listen to each other and to be heard. So without any further ado, I'm delighted to introduce our speaker for tonight, uh, Rachel Ara, a talented, acclaimed and multi-award winning artist. In 2018, she was made artist in resident at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. And I'd really encourage you to go out and check, check that as it's really, um, it's really interesting. Um, her work explores the relationships between sex, gender, technology and systems of power and her approach to art is probably best represented by her own statement that while reading art history she was less critically engaged with the writings of Carl Andre than with the accusation that he threw his wife, a fellow artist, from a skyscraper window. Rachel is interested, quote, in the conspiracies of silence, hidden agendas and their repercussions, especially in terms of the normalisation of violence against women in our culture, end quote. She owes her invitation not only to her incredible, incredibly successful career as an artist, but to Oxford Brookes University, who deplatformed her in 2019, where she was due to talk about her art practice. So now, without much further ado, I'll hand over to Rachel, who's going to talk about her feminist art and the politics of no platforming. Thanks, Rachel. That's all right. And thank you, Cambridge Rad Pems, for hosting it. It's a brilliant initiative. OK. Right, feminist arts and the politics of no platforming. So actually I use this emoji because it was the most used emoji of the previous year. It's just like, it's just for me, it's like, oh my God, what the fuck? I mean, what planet are we living on? What's happening? So it's been a real roller coaster of a year and um, coupled with the menopause, a bit of a trip actually. So where to start? I mean, it all kicked off in November 2019 when I was deplatformed, but just for liking a pretty innocuous tweet, that was it. And I guess in a sense, I'm an interesting case. I mean, I don't feel that I've really earned the honor of being deplatformed. I mean, I haven't done the fantastic work of people like Julie Bindle or Kathleen Stock and many other feminists who are rocking boats. I mean, I'm an artist and spend most of the time in isolation and procrastinating about my work, which does, I guess, have a feminist edge. And I do talk about violence against women, which is not really that sort of popular in the art world. I mean, maybe I didn't have tamed my feminism enough. 
But to me, art's about free expression and personal experience and exploring difficult and relevant subjects, not about conformity and singing off the same hymn sheet, which seems to be happening at the art world at the moment. So I'm going to have a chat for about 40 minutes. Uh, 20 minutes, I'm going to talk about my own work. And then the, the final 20 minutes, I'm going to talk about the no filming, no platforming incidents. So by seeing my work, maybe you can work out why this happens, because I'm not entirely sure why this happened to me, but I've got a few theories. I mean, I fit the demographic. I'm an artist. You know, the artists who are targeted are mainly women. They're generally older. They're often gay, not queer, and doing relatively well and probably producing more interesting work than their male counterparts. And I mean, odds on, a lot of people said it's probably to do with the politics of envy and weaponizing this subject, you know, which has nothing to do with the accusers. And it's a great one for silencing women and stopping their careers. And just another thing to note just before I get into my work is that I am very dyslexic and um, ADD, and it's not a victim thing saying this because I don't sort of subscribe to that culture. It's just explaining that I function a bit differently. Um, so I'm not reading feminist texts. I don't understand a lot of the terminology and I don't want to sort of exclude a lot of feminists who sort of are like me, which I, who I think are sort of excluded from all this arguments because they don't totally get things and that's fine not to get things. Yeah, so I'll just plug on with it. I think that's the Hoover in the background. I was told them not to Hoover. Anyway, terminology, it's, it's really important to me because we need to be able to define what we're talking about in order to have a conversation. And I guess all this some um, fixation with terminology stems from 30 years old in the tech industry where I design computer system. So clarity is really important. If we don't understand basic terminology, then we can't really derive the parameters of what we're talking about. I mean, I live in a practical world where things have to work, systems have to function, sculptures have to be made. And I'm going to start off with the art world because many of you aren't artists, so I'll define what's meant by the art world. I mean, it's certainly not the place to find interesting or cutting edge art. It's largely an unchallenged world that really has little to do with art. It nominates gatekeepers and decides whose work is worthy of being shown and how much it's worth. I mean, it's really an unregulated money laundering business, trading in objects, hypercapitalist. It's about money and power. So it's really quite ironic that a lot of, lot of young art, activist artists sort of crave to be accepted by this establishment. I mean, the global art market is worth about 60, 70 billion pounds a year. And an interesting thing to note is only 2% of the global art auction spending is on work by women. So I'm very interested in how work gets its value. So I like to use Martin Creed's work as an example. And this is his um, crumpled ball, which is an A4 piece of paper, which is made into a crumpled ball. And I guess while the work has some philosophical merits, for example, it plays with the definitions of art and questions and subverts them. It's not entirely a new idea. So if we go back to um, his work's probably descendants of sort of like Duchamp's fountain, a urinal that's attributed to Duchamp, who's the um, hailed as the father of conceptual art. But it's probably the work by Elisa von Freytag von Hofen. And Duchamp even admitted to like nicking her work. So, I mean, interesting, the whole like modern art world was built on plagiarism, which is usually men appropriating women's work. So back to um, Creed's crumpled balls. And what I was seeing was not only the sex of a person plays a huge factor in the value of work, but fabrication costs are obviously insignificant, but the provenance of the work an artist is also very, very critical in value. So for example, someone like Creed is represented by Blue Chip Gallery. And these galleries are incredibly wealthy and they have these unhealthy relationship with museums. And this is why we should be interested because we, the taxpayer, pay for them. So, and they tend not to have big budgets. So the galleries give the museums money and the museums reciprocate by showing their artists and that gives the object provenance. It's like a cultural stamp of approval. So they endorse the work. Um, I mean, this process fascinates me and I wrote some calculating algorithms to create works that sort of calculated their own sales price. So this was the prototype artwork that I created Oh God, 2014, I think it started, which sold about, its sole purpose was really to display its sales value in real time. And then I scaled up the artwork significantly to play into the machismo of the art world. You know, big is good, big is male, you know, or if you're a female, you usually use a man to build it. And I really wanted to challenge all this. So it sort of weighs about half a ton, four meters long. It was built solely by women, which is me and the neon maker. And I've actually had complaints about that in lecture when I talk about that, just working with women that I'm a man hater. 
I mean, obviously, in terms of money, we get paid far less and it has an impact on our practice. You know, we tend to have smaller studios, no assistance, less time to practice. So really, I was questioning how values are apportioned and who controls them. And then I made a bigger one for career later on in the year. Um, so that sort of um, works out its value in um, Korean one, hence the bigger value. So that, yeah, that was a magnificent piece that showed in the MMCA in Korea. And it's going to carry on playing until I stop. There we go, next slide. All right, so I guess I've always been interested in sort of values and why men's work is worth so much more than women's. And this was when I looked at the Royal Academy shows and done a grey triangle by Alan, Alan Charton that was worth 60,000 pounds. So I sort of fabricated my own and sort of started pulling it and bending it. And also interesting around how values are placed on women, you know, in terms of commodity and prostitution, servitude. I mean, literally women had a price on their head. And I was also pulled up about this, talking about this on a lecture as being a sort of swerf or not sex positive enough. Anyway, so and, that, and then I sort of create these technical drawings um, where I sort of, I mean, because everything I create in a sense is a one off. So I'm very big into making my work and I love talking about it and sort of empowering women to make their own work. And this is me working on the pieces in my studio. And for example, like when I install the work in Korea, I don't have teams of people, it's just me. And I sometimes get my girlfriend roped in, but um, we're in these museums for days installing these pieces while you find a lot of the men will have assistance to do that. But in Korea, I needed help with back frame because I work with women fabricators. I had to find a Korean welder. And um, I mean, that was really, really difficult, but I managed to find one in the end. And I mean, women are just so super cool. She turns up to the job with sort of her tools in a handbag. So I had to photograph her handbag. And this is us actually installing, just so you can see the work behind it in the sort of um, MMCA, which is about like the Tate in Korea, installing the piece over a few days. I'm just whizzing through the sides quickly because I like visuals. And now I'm just going to talk a bit about myself so you understand the background of artists. I mean, basically, I'm called a data and conceptual artist, which means my work's really based more around the idea. But for me, it's quite important to know where the artist is coming from. And my work and life are quite intertwined. So it's interesting to know, I guess, the formative experiences of why I work in such a way. So I always say my first one is experience of being a woman and all the associated baggage, especially working in male dominated environments. I guess the second I spent 30 odd years working in the tech industry, programming, analysis and design. And this kind of honed in, honed in my technical skills and my feminism and where I started experimenting with data, sort of looking at the sort of sex pay gap, because I was quite aware that I was getting paid a lot less than the men for doing the same job. And I think for number three, I'm also a trained cabinet maker and I make stuff. So this is the workbench I made for my studio. And I like to be involved in all aspects of the um, making process. So we go back to sort of when I started doing art in the 90s. Um, and I was very much working around current concerns. I think I, mean, I was a young gay woman in London and AIDS was really massive on the gay scene and I was working for the Terence Higgins Trust charity and I was photographing a lot of bodybuilders and gay males who, I mean, had HIV and were sort of deteriorating. So I did some works around this subject. And one of my favourite was this um, um, rubber piece that sort of like, it was a kinetic piece that sort of pushed in and out which was actually um, picked up for a collection. And then I moved on to Goldsmiths. I doubt I would survive there now, actually, um, where I made a film um, which got picked up by the British Film Council of me and my grandmother. Which, I mean, she was a brilliant role model. And then after I left university, I mean, just to say there's no money in art, especially if you're a woman and especially if the work is feminist. I mean, it's not a commodity. People don't want to buy it. So I sort of went off working for 15 years. Um, in, in the tech industry and then sort of came back in my late 40s. So some older women find this inspiring. You know, you can pick up your career when you're older. So the first work I started doing here was around the um, Nigella incident. Is it when, when uh, Charles Saatchi um, tried to strangle Nigella or was sort of mucking around with her face in the cafe? So these were sort of three large tondos which were taking the paparazzi photos um, when he was just manipulating her face and calling it a playful tiff. And then I moved on to doing sort of some more cameos, again, based on the paparazzi photos of her putting his hand over her mouth. 
And then I moved on to um, other works of just playing more with data. And I was looking at sort of um, focusing on male violence and crime data. And I think when people hear figures, you know, like two, three women are killed a week, it, it sort of blends into the background and doesn't really mean that much, although it should, or the impact is lost. So it was trying to like physicalize the data. So you could actually see where, where this murder or where this assault had taken place. So I actually created worksheets for people to actually go and read the police stats and um, go and do this. And so actually using a technique they use in Palestine, we sort of cut the stencils, or I cut the stencils into the bottom of bags. So you could actually spray these covertly onto the street. So there's me in my beard hat, sort of pretending I'm rummaging around looking for my lipstick. I don't know of why lipstick, I don't know, but anyway, and then spraying stencils on the street and then sort of moving on. And then another work that I'm really quite fond of is the um, series called The Death of Anna Mingetta. Um, probably as many of you are quite aware, Carl Andre, who still shows, um, he pushed his wife allegedly, but he did push his wife out of 34 fl um, floor um, tower block. And um, well, she obviously, she obviously died, but her body, the scene was never documented. So what I did, I mean, the court papers are sealed, but someone was, and his friends were very famous artists and the abstract expressionist in New York. So he had a lot of money to sort of get out of this. So what I did was take the evidence I could take and looked at the meteorological data and the timings and I recreated um, the death scene. So I sort of modeled the tower block, modeled the, um, the light at the angle. I was gonna make an animation around this. And then it was just this glimpse of light just after her body had been removed. And I mean, for me, that was sort of quite emotional. So I just, I ended up just creating a great sort of CAD photograph of this moment that the light would have actually been shone on her death scene. So I'm still kind of, although I've been working, that was years ago, I'm still sort of picking this up now to make a public sculpture now to sort of fall on women. Um, basically women have been killed by domestic violence. So it'd be quite interesting to see if I could get a venue for this. It's about eight meters long and it sort of uses the light. Um, which sort of will change throughout the day. So I would like to get that made into something quite soon. Another piece of work is a small act of violence, which is an installation and performative work. So it takes the text of Valerie Solanus, which I'm sure quite a few are familiar with. And um, I translated it into a binary and got, got women to sort of physically punch it into the walls of the gallery. So, I mean, this was really talking about, it was really an act of resistance disguised in visual terms by aesthetic minimalism. That it's about censoring women's language. So a curator, curator, Laura Hudson, wrote a great thing, like what is beaten into Solanus's call for, act, for action, in Solanus's call for action, each small act of violence is an account of the violence women suffer and reaffirms the changes that need, that need to be made. And the whole, I, I've got all this stuff on my website, the whole script's there, I'm sort of whizzing through. And then I had a year at the V&A as artist in resident responding to their data. Uh, I mean, that was actually amazing, that job. And I guess I got the gig uh, because of my technical background and, and craft also. So after a year there, where I sort of um, was sort of exploring their concerns and stuff like that, I created a work called The Transubstantiation of Knowledge, which was really bringing holographic nuns back into the medieval Renaissance galleries. And how this came about, I mean, I guess I was going around interviewing all the people at the VNA, and it's 70% female. And having worked in a tech, envir tech environment where I'm usually the only woman on a project, it was, it was so nice to actually work with women. My God, what a difference. Anyway, but they ended up like counseling sessions, sort of less like meetings. And they were telling me, you know, I mean, obviously I was aware of the, there is, a, they have got a gender or sex pay gap there. And um, they have these computer systems that are absolutely bloody dreadful. And they, they can't really contain sort of all the knowledge and information that really needs to be stored on them. And it makes their job more difficult and their goodwill is really taken advantage of. And then in the picture there, you can see the chapel of Santa Chiara, which, you know, where these poor Claire's lived 500 years ago. And again, there were intelligent women who left their families and um, their labor was very much taken advantage of um, by the Florentine merchants, you know, when they were going, just, um, weaving these gold threads, et cetera. And it was just incredible how much over 500 years, really not a lot had changed. And so I was looking at sort of, you know, how women sort of exchange information in those times. It's like through discourse, you know, or through chatting, just conversations. I suppose men see these as being trivial, but so I was looking at sort of the exchange of conversation between nuns and there we've got women who were sort of like weaving magnetic cores or memories in the 1960s. 
and so I sort of created this whole story about how the silent order sort of wove these um, codes into the back of the priest chasuble, so she, the priest robes, and how the priests who had the freedom were able to take these codes around. And actually, these codes are like fully decipherable. I mean, this this one, if you actually sat down and deciphered it, it um, it translates to again one of Solanus's texts. And then I actually placed them within the collection at the VNA. So I mean, it's it's quite a complex and layered project, but um, yeah. But I'm just I'm sort of skimming over it. And it was quite yeah. It was again done on very very little budget, a bit like the poor Claire's. And this is another work I did at the Barbican. It was a commission. They wanted artists to respond to um, the political climate. And um, actually, I was talking. It was my mother's idea. <laughs> my mother's idea. Um, I had this very difficult wall. We were talking about um, American Beauty, the film and the paper bag scene, which was wonderful. And I just thought, my God, if you, it, it was so sort of poignant that scene. But I, if you substituted the the um, paper bag for Trump's wig. It would be wonderful. So you had Trump's wig sort of dancing around the Barbican. So I had this um, this wall. So what I did is call it um, called it a Trump loyal, which obviously is a play on the word Trump because I, I misspelled it obviously anyway. So it actually gave it this depth. And then throughout the day, you know, Trump's wig would sort of be slowly moving. It had a day and night scene. So that was up there for about a year. And we're just coming into the last, uh, nearly last piece. So this was my pre-COVID commission um, called Descent Module Escape from Samarias. And it was a commission done by the um, CoLab who they aim to vis increase visibility and create opportunities for women artists to make large scale outdoor work. So it was a really great initiative. And that was at UCL and Slade. So the first thing I did was obviously do some investigation into sort of, you know, what was going down there. Um, what their main concerns were, which seemed to be sort of mental health and Brexit. And I was taken by, I mean, obviously the lack of women in STEM sort of was quite influential. And they had this thing called the Bullshit Report, a study that proved that richer young men were more prone to bullshit than women. I mean, I'm still wondering why they had to do a report for that. And um, yeah, and there was also a study on menopausal whales, which was quite interesting. Female whales were living up to 300 years. And generally, the females are what are deemed in patriarchal society is pretty useless post-menopause. So I was interested in seeing well, their sort of role. They've done this report on them and, and, and really what their purpose was about passing down information, which is kind of recurrent in my work. And also this thing about an anaconic chamber. So I wanted to sort of build this, um, this sort of descent module that sort of has arrived with a sort of feminist edge. Um, yeah, and also, yeah I'll, I'll move on. Um, so it started with this, this 737, 77 door that I got on eBay from this um, dodgy bloke in Luton. And then I sort of started building, hand building this um, piece myself. This is the descent module. And I mean, here she's in bits in order to sort of get out the studio. There's a few sort of photos. And I was building this anaconic chamber inside that sort of like muted deep voices or male voices because women tend to thrive a lot better when they don't, not subjected to them. <laughs> and um, yeah, I've got I've got this uh, mid building this this is when um, the no platforming um, happened which was a bit of a, a wrench so then I then I sort of sort of um, took this no platforming I guess and sort of like sort of filtered it into the work it's then it became more of a sort of place to hide I suppose and a place to sort of block things more than I, I guess more than it was before and then um, the interior the whole yeah, and it's sort of granted access to people and, and the whole interior is controlled by AI, feminist AI that I called um, Valerie, that's sort of programmed by women. So this was the, the inside, it had a wonderful feeling in, inside of um, silence. So the idea that it would um, decide who it was gonna let in and then there would probably be sort of readings of sort of feminist texts and some sort of interaction between women in different countries. But then, you know, COVID hit and um, that was that. So I had to immediately shut it down. So, uh, you know, I was just saying at that point, the whole world was no platforms. It wasn't just me. And then I sort of moved away from that. I mean, obviously, it was a very difficult time. And um, I think because there were issues, projects had been cancelled and people weren't really very willing to show me. I thought, well, because I've got a girl yellow van. Well, I'll just sort of make my yellow van the gallery now so I don't have to rely on these, these gatekeepers. And I think during 
Yes, yeah, so during the lockdown, I'd, I'd been so pissed off by the way um, the whole COVID thing has been handled. And I was really annoyed about the Dominic Cummings incident. I sort of wrote this on the back of my van, I test in pro progress that sort of, um, what's his name, Piers Morgan sort of retweeted everywhere. So, you know, I sort of realized that, um, you know, I was getting thousands of followers sort of actually with my work existing on the van. And yeah, I'm now expanding it to sort of the Museum of Van Art now, MOVA. So um, this is my gallery now. And this was sort of the worksheet I did for the, um, the new work, Outrageous Algorithms, which is really about council, council culture and stuff like that. And then that's, I actually just drove it into a gallery. There was an empty gallery and did a photo shoot and then drove out again. So that's 20 minutes on my work. And now I'm gonna speak for 20 minutes about the no platforming. Okay, so oh, this is a weird thing. I, and it's quite difficult going over it again because it was a difficult time. But for me, this this kind of happened out of the blue. I mean, I think, I'm, as I said, I'm an interesting case as, as I'm not sort of, you know, I'm not an accomplished femin feminist like a lot of people who, um, like I said, they deserve it, deserve the honor of being no platforms. Um, yeah, but I, there are a lot of stories. I mean, since this has been happening, a lot of women have been contacting me to say, say this has happened to them. So this is my story and it, it might be different from um, other people's. So I suppose it's good to have a background to see where I stand on the queerometer. So yeah, what are my politics? I mean, is that even relevant? I mean, I'm gay. I've never been too keen on the word lesbian. I always think it sounds like a venereal disease. Um, but anyway, when I, when I grew up, it was like homosexuality was illegal and I grew up in a very sort of Spanish Catholic household. So it was difficult. But when I was younger, I was involved very much in gay politics. I worked for the Terence Higgins Trust because I had friends with HIV AIDS and lesbians were very supportive to gay men. And we all mucked in and help. And I was around for the sort of age of consent and the clause 28. But I then moved out of the um, UK for a decade. And I think I missed fundamental changes that happened at the time. Um, and I came back in my late 40s when I restarted my art practice. So these are a few indications of signs of things to come. So I was invited to show in a show with the word queer in the title. And I thought, oh, that's great to show with gay artists. So um, when I went up there, I realized um, not many of them were gay. And I didn't really understand why these people were calling themselves queer. Um, and I got an academic, she explained it to me and um, she gave me an excerpt of Judith Butler and uh, I didn't really understand a word, so I was none the wiser. And then uh, another incident started at a museum um, and I was speaking to one of the researchers about Jermaine Greer and she likened her to a paedophile and I was really, really, really taken back by this. I didn't really know what she said, but I think I was clever enough to really knew that I shouldn't have pursued the conversation. So I sort of went away to do some, um, some, some research. So I started to get really sort of curious and I went on Twitter, probably like a lot of you, and I was sort of liking and retweeting things. And I still didn't feel I really totally understood what it was. And I never really, I never posted anything on this subject as I didn't really feel I knew enough, but um, I mean, it all seems a bit bonkers. I, you know, initially if you, if you come at it raw, it's just a bit like satire. It's hard to believe it's actually true. Anyway, I retweeted these two posts, one by the LGB Alliance, which I mean, I think the LGB Alliance is a jolly good idea and they're very, very reasonable. And the other was um, Alison Bailey, who was being harassed by Stonewall. And that was it. I just retweeted those two. And obviously someone was sort of monitoring who was retweeting and then boom, it all kicked off the night before. So I had this talk that I was gonna do at Oxford Brooks and um, at eight o'clock I got a warning that someone had been tweeting about me. Um, and I went to look at the tweets, but I'd been blocked. I didn't know of a thing called Turf Blocker then, but I think anyone who likes an LGB Alliance tweet is sort of added to the Turf Blocker. So, I mean, you can see the tweet here, like giving transphobe a uni platform is unacceptable. We encourage students and staff to pick it and raise complaints. You know, campus must be safe for everyone. You know, and I was thinking, I didn't even understand the word safe at that time. I'm thinking like a 56 year old woman going up there, do you know what I mean? And all the students have been sort of, you know, corralled to sort of protest against me. I mean, you know, who's the one who should be feeling safe here? Um, and it's quite hard to take seriously as well with the language being used um, as well. Whew. Yeah, I don't know, it's such an odd thing. Anyway. Yeah, so Oxford Books, what they wanted to do is they wanted to have a chat with me before I came out. I was still prepared. I'm, I'm bloody minded. I, you know, I wasn't going to let a few sort of neurotic students put me off. 
So just before I was about to leave the house the morning after, I got a um, email from Oxford Brooks that said, I'll read this to you. I'm very sorry to be writing to say that things have kicked off a little bit over here. And a complaint has been made against me personally, which has come my way via, via the first chancellor. And I'm afraid we're going to have to postpone today's visits while I deal with all of this. So, um, you know, and that was a bit annoying that they sort of capitulated to these sort of like um, a couple of students, because I had a few insiders there to say it was just like one person who was just um, causing all this problem, saying they feel unsafe. So I did a post on Twitter. I don't think I had many followers. And that sort of kicked off a chain, chain of events. But I mean, what irks me the most about this process is the lie. You know, I mean, one of the biggest criticisms of no platforming is that it's not happening. I mean, well, statistically, it's not happening because universities are saying it's not happening. I think my um, cancellation or postponement was put down, I'm looking at this now, um, to a booking error. And or some, well, similar to that, but I mean, I was listening to something the other day, I think Ash Sarka was talking about no platforming and said it's incredibly rare and doesn't exist. You know, all the cases were um, actual, not no platformings, but um, booking errors. I mean, to be honest, I mean, this, this was a direct reaction of all the pressure. I mean, it, it even said so much in the emails. So I'll just add that I never actually had an apology or any proper correspondence with um, Oxford Brooks after this. And I'll just, the organisation that um, tweeted this, they're called Turf South of Art. Now, their anonymous Twitter account, you know, notice the um, tip-offs are welcome. So when they tweet, it doesn't really get tweeted by many other people. I mean, they only have to reach a few people. And the retweeters are notably an organisation called The White Pube, who are two influential young curators. Someone called Lula Nunn, she's, she's a senior communication manager for the Sherry Blair Foundation for Women. I mean, you can't make this shit up. And then Oxford Brooks, um, LGBTQ. Um, and there's another bloke who I can't mention because he's very litigious, but he's um, in a trio with Sheila Buff, who uh, has a tendency to be violent for women. And yeah, he emails me and he doesn't want to know. Anyway, the statement of intent, you know, and also they've got a statement in the tent and it's pretty shocking. I mean, someone read it the other day and said it read like a fatwa. You know, they have this sort of hate and the, and the way they go, we denounce. I mean, it sounds bonkers, like we denounce and that there's just hate for these people who they call TERFs. So I'm just going to talk a bit about the influences in the art world. Um, so there's a young couple called the White Pube. Um, so they've got an ear of a lot of the big organisations. They've spoken at key, key galleries, for example, the Serpentine, and they've also had residency at the ICA. And they've been responsible for the demise of quite a few older women artists and handing people out of jobs, sort of probably ironically giving people white pubes. But interestingly, most people they seem to target seem to be female, gay, and um, of colour. And they were quite happy to infer us a Nazi and fascist fascist without any research. Um, and their usual go-to response is like, I don't care, obviously, with um, odd capitalisation. You know, it's a bit like playground bullies. But they've sort of um, captured the sort of zeitness of wokeness and victimhood in the art world very well. And, I mean, it, you know, it's worth taking note, I mean, you can see from their tweets, they're obviously slightly bonkers. And um, another one, I guess, is influential in the art world is someone like the Turner Prize winner, Taishani. I mean, she lectures at the Royal College of Art. And um, these people have a huge influence over younger people in the art world. I mean, Turner Prize is quite contentious, but young students would aspire to this. And the fact she's a tutor at the RCA would also give her credibility in the art world and amongst younger students. So you kind of have to take responsibility for what you say. So for the Turner Prize, she created this work that involved building a city of women, which is derived from a Christine de Pizan's City of La Ladies, which is a feminist text from 1405. So Semiramis is a city of women built by women, but Taishani always has very quickly, but not just women with the womb. You know, she, she needs to stay safe and tail toe the line here. So she, she says in one of her tweets, on oh, tweets, Instagram, that I want to make it very clear that the city of women in my world is a city for all women which includes trans women, non-binary, GNC, that's me, and all bodies like me that find cishet masculinity an abject nightmare, totally lost, and, um, but not for TERFs. Okay, so really it's a city of women is, is for women, but um, not, not women, men. But there's a lot of um, anti-TERF sort of rhetoric, but, you know, and this is being taught at the top universities in our country, 
And now I'm just going to go on something that I think is pretty damn shocking. I mean, it might be of interest that, you know, it's not people like me who being no platform, that our work is being excluded from national collections. And this is an absolute scandal because I mean, we, we fund them, the taxpayers fund these. So national collections are in the national interest and they preserve important works of the time, you know, for, for, for sort of to get a snapshot of the time and for future generations. And I was contacted the other week by an artist in her 70s. And her work has just been excluded from a national collection by a household name curator because she wrote something that appeared a tad turfy. Now, I actually had a look at what she wrote and it wasn't at all. So, and she was also told that her work would not be reconsidered for a long time. Now, I've also seen this happening in another sort of national collection. I mean, this is gonna affect generations because it's gonna misshape the view of this time if all these sort of gender critical women are excluded. And let me contrast with this double standards. Okay. So, you know, there's a lot of talk about can we separate the artist from the abuser? I mean, yeah, it's cool to do this, except when it comes to women. So, I mean, Eric Gill, he's an overused example, you know, great British artist of the 20th century. You know, he sexually abused his own daughters and his pets and wrote about it. I mean, the list of male artists, past and present, who abuse is horrendous. I mean, you've got Picasso, Hoffa, Goga, Roger Hilton, Chuck Close. And they're not excluded from collections. So a woman who likes a tweet or thinks that men can't become women is banished. Yet you can actually go and like be a sort of rampant paedophile and write about it. And yet the VNA will have you the tape, will have you. I mean, here I'm sort of getting a slight sliff of misogyny coming in. And maybe this has nothing to do with um, the trans debate. Anyway, back to my no platforming. So, yeah, I mean, back to my tweet saying the talk was cancelled. I mean, it wouldn't have entered my mind to sort of sue or press legal charges because I didn't think it really warranted some action. Yes, I was pissed off, but I was contacted by a lot of people who said this has happened to them and by tutors of students who were very supportive. And also this was becoming a lot more public and there was an influx of interested parties who wanted to lay their own claims in a variety of ways without taking into consideration what was best for me. So I say this to highlight that because there was a lack of support for women on this issue and often we're left with impossible or no choices of being deplatformed. It's very lonely and isolating. And I must thank at this minute, I mean, Kathleen Stock, she's actually brilliant and guided me for the first month because it was really difficult. So, I mean, when I realised why this is all this is happening and a lot of this was due with the Stonewall sort of capture of organisations and I didn't really want other women to go through this, um, I thought, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not about suing to get money, which I thought suing was about. It's really about suing to set a precedent. Precedent, I can't even say that, but you know what I mean. And I wasn't really prepared for newspapers um, as well. I mean, the newspapers kept calling and I had no idea how to deal with them and talk about misreporting and lying. And they kept trying to trip me up. And, and all this, everything you Google about me now is just tri transphobe in brackets. And, and no one notices the, not brackets, they're inverted commas. No one notices the inverted commas. You know, I am the transphobe. And um, an example recently, when one, of, one of the major papers phoned up, said, are you going to sue? This was with the new Gavin Williamson thing that came in. And I said, um, no. And they said, are you going to sue? And I said, mm, no. And then I, I happened three times. And then ugh, they actually got me to say yes. And so that was the headline, you know, that I was going to sue. So, I mean, I guess you need training on this. But, and, and this is when it really starts to sort of have an implication on your family and friends. Um, and that's the difficult bit. I mean, I could deal with this on my own, but, um, you know, people would phone up and say, you're all right. Or, I mean, obviously, then some people think you are transphobic, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah, and then going back, I mean, the mid-platforming, then sort of COVID arrived. But um, there were studies on the impact of the COVID pandemic on the transgender and non-binary com community. And, yeah, luckily for me, COVID was more transphobic than me. So I sort of fell a bit into the, you know, background for a time. And it's a bit tricky to sort of ascertain the full impact of the no platform because of COVID. But I can tell you, it happened at a time when things were going really well. I was showing at the MMCA, Seoul Vienna Biennial, v &A, and I just won the first public commission. And I was gonna work on a couple of really sort of major projects. And what happened is I was dropped from these two projects. I mean, no one would say explicitly why. There was a noticeable lack of being asked to talk at events because universities don't want to be um, associated with someone who's allegedly transphobic. Um, other artists, oh my God, I mean, like I said, there's a handful, not even a handful of other artists who would speak up. Um, they just don't want to get involved 
you know, and they ask why I sort of can't let go of it, but it's just, I hate lies. I just have an issue with, I find it very hard to let go. You know, I still haven't got to grips with why they make cars that go over 70 miles an hour when 70 miles an hour is the limit. So I kind of want to understand how men, how can men become women? You know, and what's the arguments? Why can't we discuss this? And, and, and don't people realize the impact it has on women? It's not just about, you know, sort of hashtag be kind. I mean, and the whole thing is like a game of opposites, sort of it's infuriating and, in, and incredibly childlike. And most of the women caught out by this are, are politically left-leaning, but they call us right-wing and fascists. I mean, you know, I mean, some of the language they use tends to be quite misogynistic, but that's turned back on us that we're misogynistic. Um, lesbians are homophobic. That's a great one. Transphobic are transphobic. I mean, I've had some trans friends who've been incredibly supportive and um, they're called transphobic. And the best one is, is yeah, they can't win that. You get to be called a white supremacist, which has happened to a couple of black friends. So, I mean, you can really see that this has nothing to do with political causes. It's just the whole thing is a disruption tactic. Um, and people are too scared to, um, to point this out. They don't want to be smeared with this or to lose their jobs. So here is some um, student. I gave a talk at UAR quite recently and the student union decided to give a statement. And they were saying like, we, which has since been removed. We are now um, giving hate speech a place within our university, impacting the minds and attitudes of future creatives and enabling an environment of bigotry and exclusion. And there's this whole thing about how I peddle hate speech and how the students are going to feel unsafe and stuff like that, which was written without any research into my practice. I mean, this is all stemming from like liking a couple of tweets. But as I said, I mean, recently they have actually removed it because A, they were surprised. They actually watched my talk and then they said, oh, she doesn't say anything hateful. No, I'm just talking about my fucking work. You know, you'd know that if you actually researched. And, you know, and probably it was pretty um, libelous. I mean, a curator wants to work with me recently and saw all the transphobic stuff and then um, realised, then did some research, watched all my talks and watched all, everything I'd written and realised that, you know, obviously I hadn't said anything like that. And there you go. So, I mean, be, you know, and all this is reminding me, actually, the misogyny here is of Cash, Catherine like, Switzer when she was being pushed off the Boston Marathon course. And the call was, you know, get the hell out of my race and give me those numbers. This is what the men were showing. And it sort of rings sort of true of this. You know, I mean, can't we see the sort of irony of like calling sort of like um, lesbians homophobia or homophobic? Oh, it's just absolutely bonkers. And it's like, you know, my first degree was sports science and I was a transit triathlete. I used to run marathons. I used to run them in this fact before we were officially allowed to run them. It was only 1988 that women were officially allowed to run marathons. And, you know, as I was growing up as an athlete in Mono, I was very aware of the sex differences between male and female athletes. And, um, you know, and, and the when boys' performance became exponential to the sort of girls. So, you know, now I'm trying to be told that... Um, men should um, be competing in women's sports is absolutely nuts. I mean, you don't need a scientist to prove that. It's just common sense. And the thing that annoys me about the whole of this is that, um, is, is that um, students have lost role models. I mean, I think it was really important for sort of young, especially like GNC or gender non-conforming students to see people like me, you know, women who actually made their work and who talked about the making the work. And the downside is that people like me you know, now not being allowed to speak in universities. I'm going to actually um, just because I am actually banging on a bit. So, I mean, this was a bit about the sort of replatforming. platforming. Yes, they do re did replatform me. Yes, it took a lot of effort to actually get them to advertise. They didn't even say the time. And uh, some friends DM'd and never even got sent links to the. Um, it's very half hearted, but I mean, to put it in perspective, I, the. There was a talk the following week on celebrating trans art and they didn't even put up the advert till they were mid mid talk anyway. I'm not going to do Barbara Streisand and Alpen because that was a bad idea. So um, the future, you know, you know, what, what are we going to go now? So there, what, what's happening is there's a, there's a sort of group of people I know, a friend who is setting up an organization, the International Network of Powerful Women Artists. So what we're going to do is offer a mentoring support professional practice, skill sharing networks, exhibition online support. So it would really be a place where sort of gender critical women can come and hopefully there'll be a website in the next few weeks on that one. And also there's um, someone called Conchie. This is sort of an advert. She's um, planning a show of work, which has either been deplatformed. You can see that there. I would not get shown because it dissents from the current art world. Like, so, um, 
I mean, if you contact me or if you just take a snapshot, so if you've got anything to do with that, you know, get in contact with her. So women are starting to sort of make grounds and create these organisations to sort of circumvent what is happening on the art world. Now, that's 41 minutes. I could have ranted on, but I just think everyone's probably left. <laughs> Thanks, Rachel. That was really fascinating. I really enjoyed it. I'm not, I wouldn't call myself an art connoisseur or anything like that, but it seemed like your art was really reflecting real world problems. Um, and I really, I really enjoyed that. Um, so we've got loads of really interesting questions. I don't know if we'll get through um, all of them, but thank you for asking them anyway. Um, we'll start off with some more general ones um, and then move into more um specific um so fion asks can we can we ever or should we ever separate art from the artist oh that's a difficult one isn't it i mean i could go either way on that i can go either way on most things actually and that's good to debate um i mean there's i guess it's my opinion what you think i find it hard I, I find it really hard. If I know a man has been an abuser, I really find it hard to look objectively at his work. But it depends what they're talking about, because sometimes I find it difficult when you get straight artists sort of portraying uh, gay themes, for example, or stuff like that. Do you see what I mean? I kind of, in a sense, have to trust in the in integrity of a work or uh, and of the artist. But then you might see like some Picasso works, which are is quite amazing. And then what are you going to you're going to think why he mistreated women. I mean, but once you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's a case of it can't be unseen. It's always there, isn't it? So that's a difficult one. But if they like to tweet, no, I wouldn't. <laughs> yeah, it's difficult, isn't it? Because it, it transcends beyond the art world. Into yeah, I mean, just saying that, I mean, just even having discussions around this is great, you know, because it will open up so many other things. And, and, and it's a discourse that's the most fun thing, in a sense, in art. Or well, used to be. <laughs> Indeed. Um, for that now. So um, I guess on a similar um, note in terms of um, how you portray things, you said you find it frustrating when, you know, straight, some straight artists portray um, like gay themes, etc. cetera. Um, somebody asked, as an artist, do you find it difficult to produce art about male violence towards women? while also be, being sensitive to the privacy of murdered and abused women? Oh, absolutely. So I do, I do, do, do tend to be quite some general about it. Yes, of course, because it's actually interesting when I was doing that sort of stance of disapproval. I mean, they actually gave us sort of geolocations. I was actually quite aware that this probably wasn't a very good idea in, in, in some ways. Yes, because I mean, obviously privacy has to be respected, but I think it has to be talked about. And I think with, with, with Anna Mendieta, I mean, I mean, people have to know about it. I mean, they're still showing Carl Andre in galleries. Should they be doing that? I mean, there are people who do protest against that. But I, I don't think we should ever let this subject lie. Absolutely. And there's this really interesting thing, isn't there, as well, about art and um, how it can be used in consciousness raising. And um, Fionn, again, great questions, Fionn, has asked... Um, what is the role of art in consciousness raising and how can we as radical feminists practically leverage art as part of our struggle? Well, it's funny that because I think maybe art on its own not good enough and maybe academia on its own is not good enough. We need, we need multiple voices and, and multiple viewpoints as well because you have to sort of appeal to all sorts of people. You know, and I thought, you know, I wasn't a great believer of art sort of um, sort of being a great influencer but I mean you know when I showed that piece at the VNA, and I mean it sort of really had a lot of feminist narrative into it I noticed how it really brought people in to talking about these things and that's what you want to do you want to get people talking and actually that's why I like showing at art and crafts museums because people are a lot more engaged than, than, the, than the art world but yes I think it is incredibly powerful for getting people to discuss things and, and as I said, it's another way in. There have to be multiple paths in to discuss this. And maybe it would pull in people that wouldn't have come in through academia or through text. Because as I said, I'm not reading these things that maybe I should be reading. 
I think, yeah, um, there's lots of different ways into feminism, isn't there? And um, somebody's asked um, in a similar vein how art can collaborate with the radicalization of the feminist movement, given that most of uh, mostly digital content producers are, are quote unquote queer. I don't know. I'm... Sorry, my mum's shouting in the background now. That I completely. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mean how radical feminists can engage in art? I mean, I think radical feminists are engaging in art. I mean, there's you know this work like people like the Lead Spinners that are absolutely phenomenal. There's people like I mean Angela Wilde who's producing these these T-shirts. I mean, and badges. They're just radical feminists are sort of creating work is whether you deem it as sort of high art or you know whether that's a snobism in the art world but I think women are making and women are creating it is there and 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 you know what we need is is sort of maybe platforms for bringing all this together so um we can actually show women that this is being done and how they can contribute for this did that answer your question I can't sorry I got a bit distracted with what was going on downstairs uh, no problem. Uh, it's just sort of um, with the radicalization of the feminist movement, um, sort of getting away how the feminist movement has got away from feminist principles of focusing on women and girls, um, given that a lot of digital content, content mm -hmm. producers class themselves as queer, um, how can we kind of combat that using art? I think just, just, by, just by creating art and creating digital content and just you know, just, just going out there and just doing graffiti and, and just, just not being stopped by it, just anything. I mean, it's like even, um, oh, what's her name? I can't think of her name now, but the one who projects um, um, the adult human female, I think that work is fantastic. She's projected that on buildings, you know. And again, you know, a lot of people don't necessarily agree with her politics, but I think what she's done is quite phenomenal. The lead spinners are phenomenal. You know, just everyone, just keep, keep making and keep doing because again, you're going to appeal to different demographics. Start writing all over your car. You know, everything is a potential canvas. That works really well, by the way. Definitely. And um, sort of in a similar vein about, um, you said, you know, just go out and, and do stuff. Um, somebody said, um, obviously you're interested in data and how information is disseminated, et cetera. Um, what are your thoughts or feelings about the impact of social media? I know that's difficult to condense into a in short fact, answer. Social media in the world in general. Yeah, or more specifically, I guess, um, in this movement. Uh, well, you know, I mean, I mean, it's disseminated a lot of shit, but I, 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 I just think people get bored. I mean, I, I've got, you know, I've got a bit bored by that. But then I say, you know, the good part of it is I've connected with a lot of feminists that I never, I never would have. So it has an advantage. It's just whether you've got the um, facility um, to block out the crap and to engage with the good stuff. And that can be difficult. And that's sometimes, you know, when it's really good to actually just set up a peer group or have um, people you can bounce things off. So it's just not you and the Internet. It's you and you've got a few trusted people. Because I think if you engage too much in it, you, you can go down this rabbit hole and it can be quite depressing. I mean, it's like anything, it's like alcohol, it can be good or can be bad, you know, if you drink, if you take too much of it. Definitely. Moving on to some more like, um, quests, some specific questions about your art. Um, somebody's asked, what's the difference between working in um, male and female dominated environments? Obviously you said that you, you generally hire and work with all women. Oh my God, I, you would that, hmm. well, that's interesting because in IT, I guess I worked 30, 30 years with men. What's the difference? Um, I think women are more attentive to the job. I mean, I've always noticed men, you know, you know um, and then they're more pedantic, they're less critical. And what I noticed, I like working at the VNA, I didn't realize how much my confidence had taken a hit working in a tech environment. Because I mean, because I guess it's a little microaggression, it's not on that, but it's the belittling and all the things that tend to happen, which never happened when I worked at the VNA. So, and you know, when you have got this confidence, you feel um, you're more able to do the job better in a way. But it's like, you know, I do find if I ask women a question, I do, do tend to get an answer and there's less bullshit. I know I'm taking, I'm doing generalizations here, but um, there was a real camaraderie and it was, it was so uplifting after having 
worked in the male environment for so many years, you felt they were on your side. You know, and it's so much more productive. Absolutely. Um, and in terms of um, your no platforming, you said as well that the arts SU removed their statement about you, um, saying that you're engaged in hate speech. Um, do you think there's been a bit of a change recently pushing back against this sort of extreme anti free speech approach of some students or do you think it's not really and I, I just think you know it's not a lot it's just a few very very vocal ones no I don't think there has been any change at all you know and I, I you know I, I do think you know they're not on their own they're they are being guided I mean there is some hymn sheet that they're all singing off I mean the language is all the same it's almost robotic isn't it you know yeah cultish almost you turf because you know you know, you. Anyway, I'm not. Gonna, I'm not going to go there. But I don't think it's getting any better. But I um, mean, I just think I think hopefully women are getting stronger and they're speaking. And you're having events like this, and this is make such a difference, you know. Because when it happened to me, I was very, very isolated. I didn't really know anyone who engaged, and that's when I reached out to Kathleen Stock, who explained a lot to me, and it just it just made such a difference. And I've expanded my network now, so now I've got a whole bunch of women that I can rely on, and it's made such a difference. And I'd encourage people to do that because, you know, when, when, you, know, when you have that strength and you have the confidence to speak up. Yeah, and, and I'd say... Put up with this nonsense. I mean, you know, the sooner it's going to end. Definitely. Um, I'd echo my four starters comments that, um, last week that it, it feels like we're winning more. Um, and I'd also say that um, in my experience, it's the, the thought of speaking out is much more scary than actually doing it. Um, Obviously, it can leave you feeling isolated, but there's also a wonderful network of women that you can then tap into. Yeah, but make sure you've got that network, I would, because it is very, very isolating. And I'll tell you, when I did the um, the last speech, when they started targeting my mother and niece, that was awful. I mean, I came down, I don't know why they said that, I came down to breakfast and my mum just looked at me and she goes, what's a transphobe? I mean, someone had been like messaging her that I was a transphobe and stuff like that. That's That's really upsetting. You know, I can take it, but it's not fair on them. Hmm. It just shows the levels that these people are willing to stoop to, I guess. Um, obviously, you said that it felt very isolating at the time. On a practical level, how can feminists support artists whose work is being excluded from national collections? That's a question from Maxine. Well, someone has, someone has to write about that. I mean, I think it's a scandal. I have actually written to a couple of journalists going, oh my God, this is absolutely scandalous, but no one's kind of picked up on it. People need to write about it. We, the taxpayer, are funding this shit. And it's only me that's outraged. <laughs> it, it's, it's outrageous. Yeah. So yeah, writing, we need, we need more women who are prepared to write about this. We need papers who are gonna write about this. There are certainly a lot of women who are willing to speak out about it. I mean, the woman who contacted me, again, I think felt quite isolated. And hopefully I made her feel better by responding and just, you know, just telling her a bit about sort of what's been going on. But I think when women feel safe, they're, they're gonna be happy to talk about this. Definitely. And, and Sinead has said, no, we are all outraged. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I guess a more personal question, like how and what um, sort of keeps you going? Um, Sinead says, I'd like to do more, but it is so exhausting. It is really exhausting. I mean, it's, it's just like even to preparing for today's talk was exhausting because you're having to go over all this shit again. And the thing is, it's, it's, so, it's so childish in a way. I mean... And, I, and, it, and it is exhausting. How to go forward? Um, well, how to go forward is, is, uh, is really um, with a group of friends. I met some really great people who I'm sort of on a permanent WhatsApp group with. And they sort of like, they've been so supportive. And that, to be honest, that's really made all the difference. So I'd say establish a peer group. And also to create this organisation, this, you know, the International Network of Powerful Women Artists, that where we can, we can offer mentoring, support and showing and just creating a sort of new a new world in a sense for showing art and for supporting young women who well, are young and old who want to make art. Yeah, our, our um, founder Imogen had a question about um, that network actually. Um, do you have many women who are involved and can you tell us a bit more about your, your sort of plans for that? 
yeah, it's just sort of starting up. There, there will be a website that will be there next week um, with, a, with a sort of manifesto. But basically, I mean, some women will be anonymous because they hold, hold quite high profile jobs and they don't want to be outed yet or they can't afford to be. And then there's some people like us that um, obviously we're quite happy to be to be named. But it, it's really offering a place that people can come to. And, you know, we've had sound artists, filmmakers, installation artists. So it's going to offer a centre for excellence as well, you know, because, I mean, that that's in a sense the way to fight back is, is we're raising the game to create sort of, you know, to set a sort of standard of excellence for art. And, and for women to support women. Absolutely. Um, I think that's one of the most important things about speaking yes. up is so basically making people we, there. yeah so when when the social media is there I'll, I'll sort of send it to you so you can put it out on the networks but we've already had a lot of people expressing interest you just have to get it together this end fab well hopefully more information to come on that um soon then um just in the spirit of it um being a free speech event um we've got a um question from somebody that um sounds like they maybe on the other side of this debate saying, um, speaking of art, what is the boundary of freedom of speech and a harmful oppressive discourse? What is the boundary of freedom of speech? I don't know if there is, there is a boundary. I mean, obviously I, I, I mean, you know, art, art is there to sort of, um, to talk about difficult things or to work through difficult things, or maybe it just depends on your intention. You know, if your intention is to discuss, then that's good. But if your intention is to hurt, then that's very different. So maybe it is the intention. Mm. Yeah, it's a difficult one to um, navigate. Um, and somebody in that vein as well says, how do you feel about safe spaces? Um, how does this intersect with your view of art? Should it challenge people? Safe space? Oh, what is a safe space? I mean, when I sort of had the sort of like, you know, when the baying mod, more mob at ex Oxford Brooks was sort of like um, called to protest and me going up there by myself. I mean, I guess in a sense, I wasn't entering a safe space. Mm. Yeah, I mean, yes, spaces should be safe, but people, you know, people have to accept that you have to have these difficult discussions. You can't be mollycoddled all your life. You know, life is, life is hard unless we learn to talk about these things. You know, we're not really going to get any further. I mean, I was watching something about freedom of speech the other day, talking about they shouldn't platform anti-vaxxers. Well, I'm quite fascinated to see what anti-vaxxers would say. It doesn't mean they're suddenly going to change my mind. You know, and I'm quite interested to say what very right-wing people would be thinking. I'm quite happy. I would be quite happy to find out, you know, because if you do platform these people, then, then you, you, know, you can make your own intelligent decisions. So within reason, does that make sense? Absolutely, yeah. I think it's this thing of if, if you can't hear what people are saying, how can you challenge it? Yes, um, so you put that better than me. But yes, and the intent. Absolutely. Um, just looking through all your questions, they're all brilliant. Um, and yeah, on a, a bit of a sort of uh, trying to end on a bit of a positive note. Uh, somebody says, has being deplatformed, um, obviously it's had a negative impact on you, but have there been any positive consequences? Yeah, I, I, to be honest, it's one, probably the best thing that ever happened to me <laughs> because it's, it's totally freed me up. I mean, I don't, have to, I don't have to please curators or please the art world. I mean, I, I'm completely free in my art and I've met some absolutely wonderful people. And I think, you know, if you had the choice to go back and let it happen again, would you? Yes, 100%. I would let it happen again. But this time I would make sure that there's a support network around me. And that's why it's so important. But yes, it's been, it's been absolutely wonderful and I wouldn't go back. I mean, it's like, you know, life at the other side. Come to the other side. <laughs> that's really fantastic to hear. Um, it's very, very brave. Um, and just ending on a on a bit of a light note, um, Sophie, my co-president, says, "Tell us about Barbara Streisand and the Alpen." Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you. I'll tell you what the moral of this is: never do your slides when you're pissed. 
<laughs> it was a very, very bad analogy. <laughs> okay, well, well, really well, it's, well embar it's embarrassing. You'd have to have a trigger warning for bad analogies. My analogies are painfully bad, but maybe another day when I'm not sober. <laughs> Well, you're a you're a woman of great mystery, so we're going to have to <laughs> leave people guessing as to what exactly that analogy was. Um, I think we'll wrap it up there because um, th there are some really great questions, but they're sort of um, cycling over things that we I think Rachel's already covered. Um, so I'm just going to quickly hand over to um, Sophie, who will um, tell you a bit more about next week and um, yeah, what's going on with the fundraising. Thanks. Great. Thanks to both of you. And um, you can hear me, this is all right, yeah? Great, okay. Um, yeah, firstly, thank you so much for that, Rachel. That was really interesting. I am i don't know much about art, feminist art even less so, um, and now I really want to go away and look at lots of it. So um, that's brilliant. I wanted to say, um, Rachel is on Twitter under at Rachel Ara. Um, so you can get in touch with her about either of the brilliant sounding initiatives she mentioned if you wanted to hear a bit more about that before the official kind of social media for them gets out um I the other thing I wanted to say is obviously um money if you still have any left after four weeks of us asking you for it um please could you give it to Kira Bell um she's I think most of you will know that she's running this vital campaign um to protect gender dysphoric children from experimental medical treatments. Um, I think her appeal date has been set for the 23rd of June. She's still about 15,000 pounds off her goal of 75,000 to cover the legal fees. So obviously only if you, if you have anything going spare, but um, if you can, I think that would be great. Um, and yeah, that's that. I'll just, I'll just end by encouraging you to come back next week. Um, and see Kathleen, Kathleen Stock speaking on gender abolition as a goal for radical feminism. Thank you so much everyone for the questions and hopefully see you then. Thanks so much guys. I think Mary, if we close down the webinar,